Um, you should be able to record that video and audio on your end. I will also be recording and um, will, assuming all the recording works on our end, will be sending a recording of this call after it concludes. Um, so it's 3.05, so I think we can go ahead and um, get going. So I'll invite our panelists to join um, uh, back, and it looks like they're doing so. Um, and okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, so um, honored to be joined by our panelists today and to welcome you to this call uh, marking uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, today, we're going to be sharing um, updates on domestic violence, both the kind of challenges we're seeing at our respective organizations and some resources and tools that we want to make sure that the public is aware of. Um, everyone on the call now should have recording permissions. If you don't, um, you can just let me know audibly or via chat. Uh, again, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Douglas Wagner. I'm the Deputy Director of Communications at the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Uh, we're joined today by our uh, distinguished uh, panelists who will be available to answer uh, questions later on in this call. That includes David Martin, who's the Chair of the Domestic Violence Unit at the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Colleen McKingles, who's the Director of Victim Services. Caroline uh, Jamalov, who is this, a senior deputy prosecuting attorney and works on domestic violence issues. And we're also honored to be joined by Doris O'Neill, who is the director of gender-based gender violence specialized services at YWA, YWCA, Seattle, King County, and Snohomish. These folks are going to share updates and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so I'll now turn it over to David, followed by Co Colleen, Doris, and uh, Caroline, and then we will open it up to uh, the reporters who are, have joined us for questions. So um, David, you can you can take it away for your brief opening remarks. Great, thank you, Douglas. And I, I apologize for the background noise. I'm down at the courthouse, and it's um, it's very loud here right now. And and thanks to everyone for joining us. We're going to talk about. Uh, an update on domestic violence for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and as you all know, uh, there has been a surge of domestic violence in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and that's been led by an increase in violent deaths, and that has remained high. Uh, for some context, in 2019, there were 10 violent deaths due to domestic violence in King County, uh, four homicides, three suicides, and three officer-involved shootings. And in 2020, that number increased to 28 uh, with 18 homicides. And that those 18 homicides, that was the greatest number of homicides that we have had in this county uh, in domestic violence since 2007. And so far in 2021, we are on pace to meet or exceed that number with uh, 17 homicides and overall 24 violent deaths related to domestic violence. The all-time kind of high surge in felony-level domestic violence in 2020, though, um, has receded. We, our felony referrals and filings have returned to contextually a pre-pandemic rate. But even with that, I think it's important to recognize that you know 40% of all felony assaults in King County are domestic violence. And so now our court system, especially in King County Superior Court, uh, has a backlog of cases from 2020. We are still processing those cases and that, that backlog has impacted everyone. Um, and the county has recently made a number of investments to try and remedy that backlog and those pending cases and time to disposition, uh, uh, they're double what they were at the pre-pandemic level. It has been improving over the last few months, but there's still a long way to go. And the reality is the greatest impact of all of this is on women of color women specifically are disproportionately the victims of felony level domestic violence. That's it's 92% of our victims. And women of color make up approximately 60% of all felony domestic violence victims. And the accuracy of kind of a, the racial demographics of our uh, work is, is something that is in progress. Um, if you look on the KCPAO data dashboard, which we'll put in the chat, we talk about a partnership that we have with Urban Indian Health Institute and in an effort to improve our victim demographic collection. Uh, and that's very important to us to get those numbers right. Uh, we know 
Also in the civil realm, there's been a disproportionate impact on domestic violence survivors of color. Uh, we partnered with the University of Washington and Harborview to study that. And there's a paper coming out that's gonna be presented at the DB Symposium in October um, on that issue, as well as at the American Public Health Association conference that is upcoming. Um, we know that one of the critical needs for victims is civil legal representation. Uh, it is something that we've known for a long time. Uh, there was a study in 2015 by our state Supreme Court that found that victims of domestic violence and sexual assault suffer from the most civil legal problems of all. And that was an impetus to our efforts with the Office of Civil Legal Aid in 2018 uh, to create Project Safety. And that provides civil legal assistance to crime victims to help them resolve their civil legal issues as a result of victimization. And, and this program is still going strong uh, through the pandemic. We're trying to work to expand it. Um, Project Safety in 2020 opened 435 cases involving almost 1,200 victims and their families. And of those, almost 80%, or 909 victims and their children, involved victims of color. Um, so the focus of this program is equitably sound and just, and it's one that we're very excited about expanding in the future. Uh, there's additional programs that you'll hear about today on partnership with the YWCA. We're excited to talk about that, but I wanted to turn it over to our Victim Services Director, Colleen McIngles. Thank you so much, David. Um, my name is Colleen McIngles. I work as the Director of Victim Services for the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office on behalf of Dan Satterberg. And I just really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all um, about the work that we're doing here within our office to address and meet the needs as best we can of domestic violence service uh, victims in our community. Um, my position was created in 2020 as a part of a growing commitment from our office to invest in how we could be serving victims of crime more thoroughly, and that includes victims of domestic violence. And as David outlined, the increase of domestic violence we've seen in the past couple of years just really means that there's more victims than ever, which is why uh, our work uh, working with victims is so important. And like uh, David also mentioned, domestic violence disproportionately impacts women of color. And so I'm really pleased to have Doris and Caroline here to share about the innovative work that we've been doing with the Survivors First program and how that's really um, addressing some of the needs of our most, our most marginalized uh, victims going through the system. Um, our office serves and provides advocacy to victims in two specific ways. First, by providing legal advocacy, uh, crisis support and system navigation on criminal cases handled through our office, both felony and um, misdemeanor cases. And second, we support survivors when uh, through our protection order advocacy program uh, through filing for civil protection orders. And we know that the work that our advocates do every day doesn't necessarily make the front page of news. However, the outreach um, that our advocates are doing day to day with survivors is critical to ensuring their, uh, their victim rights are being followed and that their being, uh, needs are being met and that they're represented during this process. Additionally, we're providing individuals who are seeking safety through a protection order, the support they need in navigating that complex process. Since the start of the pandemic, we've seen uh, the severity of domestic violence calls increase and the barriers in accessing services increase as well. Our protection order advocacy program, um, we've seen this, it's in the responses. Um, we've responded to over 6,734 service inquiries and crisis call, triage calls through our, our program. And I think that just demonstrates the increased need that we're seeing from DV survivors in our community that are seeking safety. This is why our innovation to provide more remote and electronic protection orders has been so important. And so uh, upon um, the pandemic, we, we transitioned our services from an in-person process to a remote process where folks can fill out documents online, uh, see what options are available to them uh, to file it through the clerk's office, as well as remote Zoom hearings. 
Um, vulnerable victims and survivors do not necessarily need to physically come to the courthouse any longer. And that is a big um, accomplishment we've made in the last year. We also know that the earlier we can connect with survivors following a reported incident of domestic violence, the sooner we can get critical resources and support to survivors in need. We've ad hired additional advocates in our office to triage and support victims immediately following arrest or law enforcement referral to our office, which in turn has allowed us the opportunity to provide critical information to victims affirming the rights around bail and potential release, but has also provided our deputies more information about the impact and status concerns directly from the victim. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doris, who's gonna talk a bit more about Survivors First. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doris O'Neill. I'm a di the director with the YWCA Gender-Based Violence Specialized Services. And it is a unique partnership that we have with the King County Prosecutor's Office. Our program is called Survivors First. First is the acronym for Facilitating Information Referral to Survivors of Trauma. And it was developed with working with women of color, specifically African-American women. We noticed that um, when working with survivors, they would have criminal histories and criminal conviction with were related a lot of the time to DB. And when we think about that, we have mental health court, we have drug court, we have batter's treatment, um, batter's treatment for uh, abusers. There was no services um, available for survivors who have now been charged with a crime. They can't work with our court advocates because prosecutor's office was charging those crimes a lot of time. And so, looking at what what services could be available and Dave Martin and I, and I do have to give Dave a, a, a shout out because he and I worked around this for the last three, four years and we came up with this project. And so working with survivors of color, you know, they don't, a lot of times I have to say for African-American survivors, they, we're not aware of community resources that are out there. And so when these type of cases come about, they have nowhere to turn to. And so now that the prosecutor's office and Carolyn's gonna talk a little bit more, um, are taking a second look at these cases, we are then making those referrals of dismissing or declining the cases, the prosecutor's office then refer them to the Survivors First program. And we provide community advocacy, community resources, information and referral to survivors um, to divert them from going back down the criminal legal system. Um, we have had many success with the women that we have worked with. We have um, been able to support them with housing, with legal advocacy, um, flexible assistance, car repair, maybe they need the rent paid. Um, it's been many things that a lot of times survivors depend on their abusive partners for financial um, assistance. And so being able to look at the root causes of why we're going down this road in the first place and supporting survivors of color um, to look at which way we can go a different way that doesn't get us arrest, get them arrested. And once the cuffs goes on, life is never the same for survivors that have been arrested in front of their children, dragged out in front of their children, taken to jail, treated a certain type of way at jail, and may, many times can't afford bail. And so then their attorneys say, well, if you plead guilty, you can get out of jail tomorrow. So then they plead guilty, but never thinking about the implication of this criminal conviction on their record later on down the way, which affects their housing, their employment, their children. And one of the biggest ones is it affects their dignity to be a survivor and now be on the other end of being a defendant. And many times the survivors arrested in front of their um, abusive person. So Survivors first, so far, I think we counted up 189 cases, Kellen. Um, correct me on that number if I'm wrong, but we have been very successful. And one other thing that's different about this program is that 
Once we receive the referral from the prosecutor's office, we reach out to the survivor, opposed to waiting for her to contact us. And it has been really enlightening to talk to survivors. It hasn't always been an easy sell. Sometimes they're, they're skeptical because they don't know why all of a sudden somebody cares. And the feedback that we get is no one ever cared before. No one ever told me about community resources. And then having someone in the chair that looks like them also makes a big difference. So I'll pass it on to Caroline at this time. Thanks, Doris. And I just want to recognize too, just what a leader the YWCA has been uh, in this area and what exceptional advocacy they provide to so many in our community. It's truly an honor to be working uh, and to be partnered up with the YWCA on this important project. Uh, Doris was talking about those numbers and I wanted to point out that our, our funding source has, has also changed and has allowed us to expand the program in a really meaningful way in the last few months. Uh, previously, our funding came from the Victims of Crime Act Fund. Uh, we now were able to obtain funding through the legislature uh, and we have been able to expand the program pretty significantly. So uh, in the program's prior incarnation from 2019 to 2021, we sent about an average of 4.8 referrals over to the YWCA per month. Uh, in the first three months of our uh, new funding source or new program and having a part-time position uh, in the prosecutor's office, we've been able to more than double that uh, to 11.7 uh, per month. And we are hoping to expand further, work with municipal jurisdictions throughout King County. We've been able to get a number of referrals already uh, from the Seattle City Attorney's Office, from Shoreline, from Auburn, and we're making connections with a number of municipalities going forward. Uh, it's, our, it's our hope to also serve as a model for other counties uh, regionally and nationally as well. So thank you, I'll turn it back to Douglas. Thank you so much. As you can clearly see, we have a, a ton of subject matter expertise and experience um, on this panel. And um, so we'll now open it up for questions. Um, folks can feel free to unmute themselves or drop a question in the chat. And I, I will read it aloud to our panel and kind of help hopefully steer it to the right person. But for folks on the panel, um, feel free to jump in whenever. You definitely don't need to uh, wait for me to call on you. As we wait for um, the first question to kick in, I, I'll just invite um, anyone who wants to, to answer this. You know, what kind of um, challenges have we seen in terms of um, what, in terms of domestic and gender, gender based violence um, in the pandemic? I feel like that's a question that's probably on a lot of folks' mind and, and kind of why are we seeing this increase in domestic violence? Um, right now. You know, Colleen, I, I, I would, I'd love to hear your thoughts. This isn't, Douglas, this is a topic of a lot of debate that's happening nationally and internationally. There, there are conferences about it as to what has led to this. Um, you know, we can, we can give our anecdotal reports from King County, and that's why we partnered with Seattle King County Public Health, and we've looked to our partnership with the University of Washington, who's done surveys, uh, working with Doris and other community groups to try and answer that. I think it's a complex question we're going to be spending a lot of time trying to unpack over the years, but Colleen, I know you have some thoughts about it. I was just going to add that, um, you know, again, anecdotally, we're still researching and, and waiting to hear the research, but I think what's uh, by and large is um, what we're hearing from survivors directly, at least survivors that we're engaging with through our processes here at the prosecuting attorney's office, is just the overwhelming um, uh, amount of challenges that survivors are facing just addressing basic needs. And, um, <clears throat> and then two is, you know, that uh, sense of isolation, you know, not um, you know, just recently, you know, it's only October, but we just re recently children have returned back to school. Uh, how we look and consider about work has changed. How we uh, think and consider about how we, um, where work happens has changed. Work has shifted for many professions back into the home. And so I think in addition to that, you know, families are just engaging with a lot more um, stress. And I think 
uh, I don't necessarily think that stress is the leading cause to domestic violence. However, I think it's many components that add to the, the fabric of uh, folks' lives and what brings them into our office. And I will say, in addition to that, you know, the, the, the risk and the lethality factors that we see folks coming to the door with as far as their history of domestic violence, both reported and unreported, many unreported incidents um, that have happened. Um, you know, it just it just shows how how much um, families are are in some ways struggling, um, and and uh, survivors are trying to find ways to st stay safe and maintain some level of uh, safety um, through our processes. So, you know, I'll just add to that. Um, I think that what the pandemic has also done is exposed a lot. It's exposed a lot of issues. Um, you know, the, the great work our protection order program has done with remote orders, it took years, you know, um, for that effort uh, to see the light of day. We were really fortunate that we had partnered with a, a local tech startup right before the pandemic, but it's something people had wanted for a long time, but it took the pandemic for uh, it to be made a reality. And, and I think now also, our understanding of what is actually happening with domestic violence, not just in this community, but across the world is inadequate. Like we don't do a good job of collecting data. You know, just even this concept that I'm putting forward to everybody of violent death associated with domestic violence. There's only seven states, eight nationally, who measure violent death associated with domestic violence. It's a module of national violent death reporting that Washington doesn't do. I, uh, and I, I wish Washington did, but we don't. And so that means understanding who is dying and why um, we don't uh, to the degree that we really need to. Suicide is a huge issue in domestic violence. Many officer involved shootings take place on domestic violence calls. Domestic violence homicide is a huge issue, but we also have a number of associated homicides for people who are trying to intervene or domestic violence offenders who are killing other people. And uh, understanding those things is really important because it connects to issues like treatment. It connects to important issues like Doris is talking about with Survivors First. We have a number of women who are in prison because of their experiences with domestic violence and sexual assault and be a lot better to address those issues before the criminal justice system got involved. Uh, and I think maybe that's one of the, the, if there is any good part that happens for the pandemic is now there's greater want to invest in those types of responses. And that might, might be a nice segue. Doris, did you want to jump in? I saw you, you were unmuted at one point. Um, yeah, to, to add on to what Colleen and Dave have already said is we did see at the beginning of the pandemic, it didn't seem like it was really increasing, but towards the second quarter on, up until current, we have seen an increase and survivors are sharing that, you know, being in the home longer with the abusive person has contributed to it, not being able to get out of, you know, the house because things were shut down, that that increased um, some of the abuse also. But like Dave and Colleen also said, we've seen the, the abuse, the violence be even more intense where there's strangulation, shooting, and not that it hasn't always been that way, but it just seemed like at this time, it seemed like the cases are a lot more brutal than what they used to be, or I can't say used to be, but what they have been. Um, so I wanted to add that. Thank you, Doris. I'll, um, I could definitely keep asking questions, but I'm just going to pause and I feel like one of our um, reporter friends uh, will jump in with a question. So feel free to um, just unmute yourself or you can uh, pop a question in the chat. And if no one does have a question in, you know, 30 seconds, I, I will ask another question. Is there anything... Um unusual about our situation here compared to the other places around the country that were mentioned that are seeing similar statistics. 
Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, sometimes it's hard to compare because going back to my point about data, it comparing, you would want to compare real numbers to real numbers. And I think I'm not sure how real the numbers are from place to place. And so one of the things you would have to look at is uh, like in, in gross terms, things like rates of homicide per 100,000. King County has been a very, very safe jurisdiction by comparison with a lot of places. I have colleagues of mine who work in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Their homicide rate is several times higher for domestic violence than ours is. What I can say from, from working with my colleagues nationally is a lot of the same things that you would hear from Doris and from Colleen uh, are present in every jurisdiction. There's a huge backlog of cases. There's this enormous need regarding domestic violence. And there's a, like a real significant investment in trying to uh, innovate, to do things differently surrounding it. Homicide has surged in a lot of places, but um, every one of the studies that have come out surrounding that have said, wow, our data is just not what it needs to be. And so that, that's, a, that's a real problem that needs to be fixed. Colleen, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to that. Yeah, um, I, I can't really think of anything particular about King County that makes us unusual. Um, I think that our, we, we're suffering similar problems and, and I think, you know, in general, our, our communities are, are evolving um, as many communities have had to evolve uh, through the pandemic. So um, I'm not sure if there's anything unique. Well, you know, I guess I'll say one thing. Uh, one, one thing that I think is a bit unique is we have, because we have a very supportive community here of people who care deeply about victims of domestic violence and trying to do something about it, um, that we've been able to do some things here that other places wouldn't be able to do. Um, we've continued our work on the surrender of firearms, which is a wonderful program and very important. Uh, remote protection orders is another one. Uh, very few places in the country have something like that. Uh, we're unique in that regard. Doris's program at the YWCA is unique and was just actually profiled by the Center for Court Innovation um, as you know, as this important effort to really look at the entirety in a holistic way in the criminal justice system, just in the same way our partnership with the Office of Civil Legal Aid and a half dozen legal aid organizations to provide services to victims is unique as well. So I think the one thing that is really unique about this community is it, it, it doesn't just say it cares deeply about domestic violence, it actually steps up and it invests in those responses not just in kind of in institutions like ours, but in the community with the YWCA and with many others. Just a follow up question on the data. Uh, and yeah, that's great with those programs. I don't mean to discount that, but um, I've heard that data, particularly on um, tribal and Native American Indian communities is really lacking um, yes. in terms of the demographics. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if if that's fairly universal or, you know, in in terms of the the data, because you're talking about data here, like what is the work that needs to be done there in terms of um, communities of color? Yeah, it's a great question. And that is a universal issue. Uh, it's one uh, that UIHI, Urban Indian Health Institute, has noted uh, nationally. There are national working groups that are involved in that. We were lucky to partner with UIHI two years ago. Uh, we identified that there was a significant gap in our victim demographic information, specifically in regards to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, uh, and the question of how we are identifying tribal members, which is why when you look at our data dashboard, uh, which Douglas put, I want to say is that the, the, it is the first item um, in the link. And Douglas, am I, can I share my screen? Hey, you should be able to, yeah. Okay, just a sec, let me, let me pull this up just real quick, because I, I, it's something that is really fundamental um, to our work and that we're trying to improve. So I'm gonna, uh, hold on, Let's see if I can do this. Okay. 
So when you go to our, our data dashboard, drop, I don't know why this is. Okay, I seem to have frozen. It could be loading, I'm not sure. Yeah, can you still hear me, Douglas? Yes. Okay, well, my entire computer is frozen right now, but there's, okay, let me, yes, it is loading, but let me switch to the one that actually, that we're looking at here. Uh, there we go. So this is, um, this is our statement that we worked on with UIHI about how we're, we're working to, to address the question that you've asked. Um, UIHI's expertise in epidemiology and data collection, specifically in regards to tribal communities, um, and we'll say indigenous data, uh, is critically important and something that the legal system, criminal justice system, has not done good work on at all. So uh, we partnered with UIHI. We've gone through trainings with UIHI. We have more trainings to come. And we're in the process of really updating our data where there are big gaps as to uh, someone's race and ethnicity data. And more importantly, there are big gaps about how um, granular one would get. In our new system, we've changed our entire electronic records management system to be able to address this. We worked with our vendor to do it on advice from UIHI. We're now gonna be able to collect uh, going forward, I think there are 500 recognized and unrecognized tribes um, nationally to be able to ask about that, to do that in an appropriate and trauma-informed way. So I think there's, you know, you're, you're exactly right. And the current state of data is poor and it needs to get a lot better to be able to identify, you know, policy priorities and how to respond, especially to, to marginalized communities, women of color and others. It's a priority for us, and uh, we're in the process of trying to make it better. And I would say if you have additional questions about that, the, the expert on this nationally is local here. It's Abigail Echohawk, and uh, Abigail was an amazing resource and has uh, published much on this, and we've tried to, to absorb all of those things and implement it in our practice. Great. Thank you. Yes, I know that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, it was a long answer. You probably no, know. it was a good answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. It's thorough. Other questions? Feel free to jump in, like I said, via chat or um, unmute yourself and you can ask a question. I can't help that, I'm gonna break the silence. So uh, yesterday we released our quarterly shots fired report, which showed uh, for the past quarter, we saw a really substantial increase in gun violence in King County um, this past year. And I wonder, um, you know, Colleen, Doris, Caroline, David, um, you know, what your folks thoughts are on kind of the intersection of um, the gun violence numbers that came out yesterday, and I'll, I'll drop that report in the chat, and, uh, and domestic violence and the, num the numbers in terms of domestic violence that we're seeing. Any thoughts, observations? What, what, what is that relationship? Oh, oh you want to go? You were on mute. You, so, you go, well, no, I was just going to mention that um, Doris reminded me of, and I wasn't listening to your question, Douglas, but she just reminded me that um, our county has actually just reopened a new uh, DV Hope line. And so, and it's being managed by uh, New Beginnings and it's a collaboration of many of the community-based organizations. It's uh, DV Hope Line and uh, I'll drop the link uh, to that Hope Line into the chat. And so I apologize, Douglas, I was not listening to your question. So I'll defer to David. Well, I can, I can give a little bit of a response to that because um, to me it is, it is the intersection of firearms and domestic violence is the number one 
risk factor that anybody who does this work has to deal with, which is why Washington's laws have changed uh, several times now over the last few years to reflect this. Uh, it's why we have a regional domestic violence firearms enforcement unit. Uh, I talked to our program manager, Sandra Shanahan, and so far in 2021, they've recovered almost 500 firearms. They reviewed um, almost 1,200 civil protection orders, um, and they're examining those to see if there were allegations of any firearms in those cases. 50% uh, were assessed as firearm positive, and then there's a very intensive um, follow-up with advocacy and a firearm interview that happens after that. And so this intersection that we're seeing of firearms and domestic violence happens in criminal cases. It also happens in civil cases. So there are thousands of these intersections that happen over time. And yes, 12 of the 24 violent deaths in King County were related and involved firearms. And, and I think an important thing to keep in mind is firearm violence. Um, it is shots fired, but it's also suicides. It's also officer involved shootings. And so the different ways that firearms are deployed in domestic violence cases is really important. And we don't, I mean, we don't want anybody to die. We don't want anybody to be hurt. And anybody who's even been shot with a gun has had lifelong consequences because of it. So we don't want the prohibitions on firearms that exist in our laws to just be words, right? You have to, you have to implement that and you have to have people on the ground who are skilled to implement that is what we're trying to do in King County. And we're trying to collaborate with others nationally to learn different ways to do it. And so um, whether you're looking at community-based gun violence solutions that are happening here or system-based guns violence solutions, I think there are uh, steps being taken to respond. And I see the door is just put into the chat. Um, you know, the resources that people have. I mean, you need a system that that connects and communicates with each other. Um, all of these things are important to reduce gun violence. That is a terrible byproduct of the pandemic is the rise in firearm ownership and people are scared. Um, and when people have access to a gun at a really low point in their life and domestic violence is about the lowest that somebody can get, it's entirely, um, likely that they're going to hurt somebody or they're going to hurt themselves. And we don't want that to happen. So creating a system that really limits that and limits lethal means is what we're trying to accomplish. And that data that Shots Fired provides for us is a good metric, right? We need to know those things to be part of a larger kind of a public health response that we're a part of. Doris or Caroline, do you have anything to, that you want to add on the intersection of gun violence and, and domestic violence or even the kind of disproportionality that we're seeing in terms of uh, both of these intersecting areas? Um, I'll add to that. And looking at since we since the pandemic started um, up until current is we have seen like abuse be more brutal and that survivors are you know sharing that you know they're the gun violence or using the weapon has been more so in their abuse of in their abuse of abuse than what it was before and you know just the fact of putting a weapon on the side of the table and using it not even using it that is enough to scare survivors that are dealing with abuse um it is important that survivors know and have access to resources and everybody can be a first responder. And it's very important that survivors are safety planning. Um, it's not easy to leave a domestic violence situation. And people say, why don't she just leave? Leaving does not always make her safe, safer. And sometimes we safety plan, not sometimes, but we safety plan all the way from the phone, the first phone call, all the way to the time that they have left, and even after that. Douglas, if I could just add one comment to what Dora said, I, I just really want to echo and endorse that because when we have domestic violence homicides or really serious domestic violence cases that happen in King County, it is um, 
Doris in the YWCA typically knows the people. They have a relationship either with the families or with the friends of the individuals involved. King County is a, is a big place, but it's also kind of a small community and people know each other. And that's one of the important parts to keep in mind about community resources and, and having a, a way to connect with others and to connect with, with organizations like the YWCA. Um, the, you know, you're just only so far away from getting help. And so that's, I think, a, a really valuable resource, and we just need to invest more, which, which is happening, you know, with the, with the DB Helpline, with the resources that the Y has, but investing in community-based responses, where people are at, who know people who are on the ground, um, just as smart. Carolyn, not to call you out, you can say pass, but if you have anything you want to add, by all means. No. Thanks, Douglas. I, I just wanted to jump in and say, you know, gun violence is obviously a huge marker of lethality when it comes to domestic violence homicides. But another major one that we talk about frequently that uh, should, should get attention to is strangulation. And this is something that we see frequently when it comes to survivors' first cases. Uh, it happens more often than you uh, would expect uh, when there is a, a domestic violence incident uh, where a, a victim is being strangled and responds uh, either by uh, punching, hitting, or scratching uh, the abuser in an attempt to get him off of her. And when police respond, they see visible injuries on the male abuser, but they don't see any visible marks on the domestic violence survivor, often because injuries from strangulation can be internal, and they're not going to be visible, particularly for survivors of color uh, who have darker skin, and those injuries just aren't going to show up uh, to police officers responding. And so what can happen and what does happen is that police then arrest the survivor uh, and, and bring criminal charges against her. And so this is, this is the problem that Survivors First is trying to confront, is taking a second look at those cases, figuring out what's truly going on, and actually uh, dismissing those charges against the survivor and, um, and trying to connect her to community resources and care through the YWCA to address that, that real marker of lethality strangulation. I'm really glad you shared that. Thank you so much. Um, that's a really important point. And David just put in the chat um, a, a link to our one of our uh, earlier blog posts, which talks about a bill, SB 5183, which makes Washington the first state in the nation to um, provide forensic uh, nurse examiners to victims of domestic violence strangulation to address this exact problem that um, Caroline just highlighted. So I'll pause uh, and see if we have any questions from the group. And if not, I'll just wrap it up in maybe 45 seconds or so. But um, if you have a question, feel free to, to jump in. Is there um, training for police to catch up with that strangulation stuff? Um, yes. on, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I want David to answer too, <laughs> no, but no. I just wanted to, to plug that, that part of what we're doing is working on law enforcement training. Uh, and we have a, we're presenting at the DV symposium coming up in a couple of weeks uh, where Doris and her team from the Y and I will be there, uh, but also, um, Andy, who I'm blanking on his last name right now. David, maybe you can help me. Yeah, Chief Andy McCurdy. Thank you, McCurdy, uh, is going to be present, presenting as well. And he's uh, the deputy chief of Sumner uh, PD. And so he's going to be presenting sort of the law enforcement perspective on how officers can slow down, de-escalate, sort of check their bias and engage with people in a way that really allows them to tell their story and to rebuild some trust between officers and, and survivors of trauma. Yeah. And, and just to follow up on that, we've done three trainings in King County uh, related to the implementation of forensic nurse examiners um, put on by Harborview, who is the main trainer for uh, forensic nurses. There's a governor's task force um, that I and others are a part of about implementation for this across the state. 
and training is ongoing. Uh, we're lucky to have a really strong network of forensic nurse examiners. And then the, the question is, how do we how do we engage with victims in a strong and trauma-informed way, like Caroline is talking about and Doris is going to be talking about at our symposium, and then move people to a medical response that they can get um, at Harborview or at some of the other hospitals in the area who have uh, forensic nurses available. And so that's not, that's very common in sexual assault cases. It's been going on for many years, um, but it's not been common in domestic violence. Uh, we have not had that ability. And so we're um, training police and building a network with the forensic nurse examiners to make sure that we can get victims where they need to go. Because I, there's nothing I think more important than people getting specialized medical care for something so serious. Great. Right, I'm going to give it 15 more seconds. If folks um, have a burning question you want to ask, please jump in. I was just going to chime on to David's comment, um, just to add that, you know, our office is really focused on with our advocates on earlier interventions uh, and earlier engagement with victims that are coming through to our office, in part because we're trying to address that highest point of risk or when, when the crisis is happening. So upon arrest or upon immediate referral to our office, uh, we're getting uh, outreach out to those victims, um, in part because of the, you know, the, the. I just popped in the chat. You know, forty-five percent of DV homicides occur right after that that uh, point of separation, and sometimes the this criminal process kicks off that point of separation and puts them in higher risk. And so we're really focusing on. We've hired additional advocates to address that early. Um, uh, interaction with our with cases as they're coming into our office. Uh, and and call me just to, to maybe just to finish, because um, I think anytime you talk about domestic violence and um, the risks involved, it's important to finish on a positive note. Um, so I just put in the chat. Uh, it's not just important to be early with victims to reduce risk. It's important to be early, period, and to engage prevention. Uh, our state coalition does wonderful work on prevention. Our schools are now having um, additional kind of requirements to engage prevention. And there is a group that our state coalition and others supports called Team Up Washington that trains coaches in an evidence-based program called Coaching Boys into Men. And as a corresponding program for young women called Athletes as Leaders that Harborview uh, and the University of Washington put together. Uh, they're fantastic programs. I've been through the training. Um, and I would really encourage you to check it out. This is the link. Uh, their trainings are coming up at the end of the month in October. Uh, they're virtual, they're free, uh, they work. So. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that. Um, well, great. Well, I am not seeing any additional questions in the chat and I'm not hearing anyone jump in uh, with a question. Uh, by unmuting themselves. So I'm just going to thank everyone uh, for joining our joining our call today. Thank you so much, David, Colleen, Doris, and Caroline, um, for all the work that you're doing and for taking time out of your busy schedules to share this important information during Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, for everyone on the call, I'm going to be sending around a recap of the data points that were mentioned and the key resources, as well as a recording if uh, fingers crossed, it all works out technology-wise. So thank you again. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end the call now, but um, hope everyone has a great afternoon and, and appreciate your time today. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you.